Hope you enjoyed those three visual chapters, we're going to call them. This is a lens that is used in a number of different scenarios, not just for one thing, so it felt wrong to only show one example. Three feels like the right number to give you a good idea of what this lens is capable of in different environments. I get asked a lot in forums or see it come up in groups, is this the go-to run and gun lens? Let's talk about it. On paper, it's a slightly slower than most lenses you'll see recommended on YouTube, F4 lens, a very usable 24 to 70, very reliable 24 to 70 zoom range, optical image stabilization, a reasonably affordable price tag, and one really undervalued feature. Being an F4 lens is probably its biggest con. It is pretty slow, it's not exactly the best if you're shooting in less than ideal and lower lit environments, but it is one third of the price of the 2.8 version of this lens. If you have that much money lying around, I might suggest going a different route altogether. For the zoom range, 24 to 70 really is the ideal zoom range when you can only rely on one lens. The holy trinity, if you will, of Canon lenses to me was always the 16 to 35, the 24 to 70, and the 70 to 200. And that 24 to 70 getting the most use out of any of those three lenses because it really is the ideal zoom range where you can only rely, where you can only just carry one lens. The 24 range gets you a really nice wide side of this lens. It's not truly ultra wide, it's not anything crazy fisheye, but yeah, it's wide enough to get you a great establishing shot. And at 70, you're gonna forget all about that slower aperture because the compression really gets you some nice background blur. 
The stabilization is the first feature I have mixed feelings about. It's not something I like to use when I'm moving the camera about. When it's standing still, great. It removes all those micro jitters. But whenever you have a little bit of movement, you get this effect that feels like the camera is trying to robotically follow something and just not succeeding. It's not quite a jello effect, but it does just look funky to me, and I generally don't love how it looks. But if you're just relying on it to remove those micro jitters when using things handheld, this does do the job better than a lens without that. Then there's the price. I've seen this for as low as 517 new, and I'm sure you can find it closer to 400, 450 on the used market. And that's why this lens is in a category on its own and why it gets so much talk. Yeah, it's an EF lens, but the adapter does come with the red Komodo, so you don't have to spend money on that. We're talking about a sub $600 everyday run and gun beat it up type lens. If that's what you're looking for, I can confidently say this will fit the bill and it will not crush your wallet. My personal preference is for something a little wider. You've seen me talk about the Sigma 18 to 35 way too many times if you've been watching this channel for a little while now, but that lens doesn't have any stabilization and the Canon version of the 24 to 70 definitely beats out Sigma's attempt. Something about that lens just doesn't work for me. We're not here to compare to Sigma to the Canon. I just did tell you clearly, this is the better version of a 24 to 70. We're here to talk about this lens and what it's one underrated, undervalued, underappreciated feature is. And that is if you zoom past 70 and you click this little button here and you go into the little macro mode. That's right, this lens has a built-in macro feature which will let you get really, really close focus. I only used it on one shot in this video. And yeah, you can guess what it is. It's that eye shot where how else could I get that much background blur and get focus with a lens of this type. You don't have to bring that 100 millimeter macro if you like to get detail shots. You can rely on just switching this lens into that mode and not have to swap glass. That's a big deal and a really good feature for those of us that like to get those just small things. There's no other word for it. It's the detailed stuff. If you like it, you know you like it and you know you want to get it. But bringing an extra piece of glass sometimes just doesn't feel worth it. You don't have to if you're going with this one. It's a little bit windy. This might not even be usable, but I thought take the opportunity while on Seven Mile Bridge to ask you to like the video, maybe subscribe to the channel. I like to get to do these things. I wish I could only do these things and maybe with your support, I could do this all the time. I did try skating while using this lens. That subscribe clip didn't just come out of nowhere, but our pavement was a little bumpier than I expected. And I got only a few clips out of it that I was really happy with. So it didn't justify its own chapter. Speaking of chapters, you guys like this format? Is it fun to see the little vignettes up front? And then if you're interested in hearing more about the lens, which I'm really grateful if you are, you can listen to me talk after you see the test footage. Let me know in the comments if you like that. I'll keep doing it as long as you keep watching. I don't feel that a video about a lens needs an introduction. I just start with the test footage, and if you want to hear my opinion on the lens, then great, this part's for you. I know this one was a little slower in pace, and that's just because Island Time is still in my brain and I really wanted to have this one just be mellow like my time there was. My recommendation on this lens is if you're looking for something on a budget, this is a good option. If you can spend up and you want something that's gonna do everything for a longer amount of time, consider doing so. But with a new version and a used version being either side of about $500, this thing stays in the cheap lens recommendation section. Any other questions on this lens, how it pairs with the Komodo, just hit me up in the comments below. Until next time, thanks for watching. I'm Wolf Walkie.